Titties. Titties. Hello everybody, welcome back to Talking Tricks, and today we have Bryce with us again. Hello Bryce, how are you doing? Yep, what's up? Um, and today is going to be a pretty fun topic in my opinion, like, uh, basically we're going to be talking about uh, putting tricks on a pedestal, which I know is something that all of us do way too often, and I've become hyper aware of it but I still can't fix it for some reason. But, <laughs> but we're going to talk about tricks on a pedestal. We're also going to talk about trickers on a pedestal. And then we're going to hit a little bit on chosen one narratives uh, because I think there's a lot of, I guess, tying in with tricking and chosen one narratives that we don't think about. Um, and I just thought it was interesting to, to discuss. So, yeah, I guess we just jump into it. And, like, I guess we could start out with tricks on a pedestal. And I guess just to start out... What, well, what, yeah, let's, I think we should probably start out by explaining what does it mean to put a trick on a pedestal? Like, what are we talking mm -hmm. about specifically? What is this behavior we're, we're calling out? Yeah, I, I, that's kind of what I was going to ask you guys. Like, how do you define tricks on a pedestal? All right, quiet, Jason, you're up. Let's hear you. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't have the show notes up. I was trying to get them up. <laughs> sure, I'm sorry, I just put you on the spot. Okay, well, let me, uh, uh, allow me to go over for a moment while Jason's grabbing our PDF. Um, mm -hmm. So... The concept of putting a trick on a pedestal is giving it a special significance that it doesn't necessarily have intrinsically. And I know that's mm -hmm. like, first of all, that's like use some smaller price, but also what I'm trying to say is tricks don't necessarily have value. We put value on them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have this tendency of placing excessive amounts of value on particular tricks. Mm -hmm. And it has its uh, psychological repercussions because we've done this overvaluing mm. and I, I think some of those are positive and negative and we'll get, get to those repercussions that you were talking about in a second but i i think i also agree with that definition that like it's it's been put on a pedestal whether it deserves it or not and like i think there are examples where it does deserve to be put in a pedestal and sometimes where a trick shouldn't be on a pedestal but Absolutely. but ultimately mm -hmm. this is a value judgment so we are mm -hmm. getting into aesthetic philosophy technically here mm -hmm. because we're talking about value judgments so there is no objective value judgment so there is no such thing as saying all right this is the wrong trick to put on a pedestal or the, <laughs> the, the, cor the correct trick to put on a pedestal so we're not saying that but we are going to offer what we think are the sort of the, the good and the bad and potentially mm -hmm. even the what could happen uh in this sort of yeah i guess in light of what bryce just said to clarify my statement I subjectively believe that some tricks do deserve to be in a pedestal, and I also subjectively believe that some of them uh, do. Did I say do or do not? Anyway, the other one. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, just to throw an example out there, definitely triple cork is probably the biggest one for our era of tricks. I guess people who oh, started yeah. like around the 2012 era, like triple cork was the trick on a pedestal. I was like, oh my god, you've landed triple cork. That's that's crazy. So for many years, it was sort of the, um, the benchmark, the dipstick, if you will, that people measured themselves against. Were you someone who could or could not do a triple cork or you were you on the path to trying and attempting triple cork? Mm -hmm. That was sort of a, a very easy measurement device early on. Mm -hmm. uh, and by early on, I mean over the past 10 years and not very much lately. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, actually, I agree with you. I think that's something we actually didn't even write in our show notes, but is a really interesting thing is these are a good way to, like, at a glance, look at a tricker and say, like, oh, he's landing triple cork. He's good. Or he's on his way to landing triple cork. Like, he's pretty good. Like, he's he's yeah. getting up there. Like, you know, it's a good... <laughs> to say nothing of the uh, of the coarse graining that has that has happened when we make that judgment that quickly. But yes, absolutely. It is. It definitely facilitates uh, those judgments. It makes them a lot easier. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. I think this is a very basic human psychological thing to do. Like, obviously, I don't think this is limited to tricking. I think we do this with a lot of things. So I think it's a very human thing to put a thing or a person or something to that extent on a pedestal and be like, oh my gosh, this is unattainable or difficult to attain or like, holy shit, it's like the holy grail of whatever the fuck it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um... But yeah, so I, I guess, do you guys want to get to like the pros and cons of what 
like it might be what what might happen when you put a trick on a pedestal yeah, the, the only other thing that i would want to uh talk about before is what has happened to we went through this huge cultural moment in the past couple of years where triple cork like we were talking about sort of was this very easy barometer this very obvious trick on one of the tallest pedestals perhaps it wasn't the only trick that was on a pedestal but it was certainly on the tallest mm -hmm. would you say that there are any tricks like nowadays or have, have things dissolved a bit um i mean that's it it's hard because i i guess in the time period i grew up in triple cork was in this weird in-between state where it wasn't quite limited to the top three or four people in the world but it was also still like less than 50 that have landed it so it was a, a weird like it was it wasn't something that was limited to the absolute pros well right now if you have quad cork you're like definitely in the top 10 trickers or whatever because i, I mm -hmm. don't even know how many people are on a quad cork now but i'm i presume it's less than like 15 and that's like that's just a very exclusive club so i wouldn't even compare quad cork to triple cork to be honest with you because like the likelihood of someone who's just dabbling in tricks landing quad cork is very low uh, while with triple cork it's like i mean you had to work for it but you could just be a dabbler and really like get into doing triple corks and drilling that trick and land it and i've known people who have done that so mm -hmm. It, yeah, it really did seem like at, as hard as Triple Cork was, uh, especially after watching people like Brandon Schwerin go through their prog uh, progressions, it seemed like even average normies walking around were maybe five or six years away from Triple Cork mm -hmm. if they really wanted to work on it, which is certainly not something that can be said about Quad Cork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something you have to like train from the beginning of your life to really get, and even then you're not guaranteed it. And yeah, it, yeah so I guess to answer your question about if there's an uh, analogous thing to triple cork um honestly i mean weirdly enough i might even put cork and back out in this category because i more people have landed cork and back out than quad cork and i don't like if someone is like like cork and you're like oh they're they're really fucking good like obviously clearly so i don't know that's kind of what i want to say for my answer but i don't know what do you guys think i i think that's a pretty good answer for cork and back out we've been seeing that uh like incredibly frequently lately but more frequently than it had been occurring in the previous in previous years and mm -hmm. so i i think it's probably pretty safe to that's it's not quite on the level of so far out to quad cork where yeah like you're saying it's sort of unreasonable for people to have that expectation that they're going to get it mm -hmm. but it's still rare enough and hard enough so that when you do it and when you watch someone else do it on the floor that immediately fills the room with that sort of spiritual sense of holy shit did that just happen <laughs> right of course yeah what, what are your thoughts jace uh are we fucking wrong here is corking back out not the trick on the pedestal or uh i don't think to the extent that triple cork is <clears throat> i mean triple cork like you said was the benchmark or the like i, I like the analogy of the dipstick a lot mm -hmm. um because like it, you could tell like how you were uh, along the way to that you know by watching someone's like tea rise up or whatever Mm -hmm. uh, but like, I think we kind of grown past like having a, like one trick that is like the trick that determines your skill level. Mm -hmm. Um, and just because of like the sheer ability of like triggers nowadays is like so vast mm -hmm. and there's just so many difficult tricks you can do. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't necessarily think that there is a trick like triple cork out there. And even if there were, we've kind of like matured in a point where we don't, you know, it's not like that one trick is indicative of your entire skill set. Mm -hmm. that's, that's something that I want to talk about when we get to cons. But now that we've uh, now that we've gone over my little question, I think we should start talking about some pros and cons now. I actually have uh, one last thing to add, and I, I just want to say okay. that I think that it's interesting that Triple Cork was chosen during our time growing up to be like the defining tricking move, and that like oh that that meant like you were like a tricker tricker like you're you're really motivated to do this and this is this is for you and i think triple cork is honestly a good choice because it's very representative of tricking in that it's not seen in any other sport 
it's it's a one-legged takeoff it's not really like native to gymnastics or parkour or anything like that it was like a tricking main move the first person who landed it was undeniably a tricker you know what i mean it's like you could argue like for some of the maybe i think double quirk was actually landed by someone who did capoeira like not necessarily even a tricker so it's I think, like i think quirk actually comes from capoeira frank yeah that's what i mean so it's like a but triple quirk itself is like, oh, we're adding the power to it. That's something that's exclusively tricking. You know what I mean? So I just thought that was interesting that that's, I feel like that's the reason we put it on a pedestal. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I actually do agree with that. I used to uh, feel similarly about double B twist as well. And then I saw, uh, I saw a wushu practitioner do a double B twist. And so mm -hmm. yeah, triple quirk is the only thing that still <laughs> holds that position in my head now. Of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But all right, yeah, you're right. We should get to the pros and cons. And all right. I guess the first pro I want to talk about is that because I do think that there are some there's some value to this, and I feel like this is part of what led me to e eventually land triple quirk was like the achievement of getting these pedestal tricks is just like a fucking flood of dopamine. Like it's the greatest feeling ever because it's just so out of reach for so long that when you finally do it, you you're just in disbelief. You're just like, how the fuck did I even do that? is this real is this real life and it's like mm -hmm. everyone goes crazy and you're celebrating and it's it's a really good time so i i mean i think that's always been a feeling that trickers have chased i mean for a lot of trickers i've talked about they love the feeling of like everyone's celebrating you landed this crazy trick and whatever and you know what i mean that that is a good motivator so yeah over this particular trick type means that yeah when you do land it or when you do see it landed all of that hype gets all at once mm -hmm. and that's absolutely one of the reasons why trickers go and trick in groups mm -hmm. if we didn't do if we didn't like this we would all just be fucking lonely and tricking by ourselves all the time but we definitely appreciate this so that's that we, we can't fail to acknowledge that mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i, I don't know it, it is just such a great feeling and i it's hard to like picture something like this in other sports and i, I know it does exist in other sports but i'm thinking like I don't know, like baseball, like, I guess you could hit a home run or whatever the fuck, but like, I, I don't, it's, it's so hard to make that analogy to that because it's like, it, I don't know. It's not a def, I guess it is a defining moment, but it's just, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like it, it would, the defining moment of the singularity of hitting your first triple cork. I, I don't know if getting a home run is necessary. Like you'd have to get like 500 home runs in a row or something like something crazy. That, that's what I mean is home runs are definitely way more typical in baseball than like triple cork was back then. I don't know about now. Maybe I'd, I'd need official numbers or whatever, but yeah, it, it's just so much more of an exclusive club and that exclusivity is what makes it like such a, a prized possession to get, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, um, what are so some the hype parts? explosion? We know that by by having all of these people collectively enrich this particular trick or a particular trick with value, mm -hmm. that's going to lend itself to an incredible moment of celebration and success upon actually achieving the thing. So that's mm -hmm. that can't be ignored, and that's undeniably a pro mm -hmm. of of putting tricks on a pedestal. No one can say that that's a bad thing. You'd have to, uh, if you have an argument that that is a bad thing, I would really like to hear you make it because <laughs> it would have to be very compelling. I agree. I'm trying to think right now and like, I, well, I feel like a con that I could say about that gets into our cons. So I'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. So anyway, do you want to talk about the second pro? Sure thing. Uh, so our second pro, I just, I literally just, a uh, close of opening it okay so uh the second the second bit of uh of our pro here that putting tricks on a pedestal had to do not necessarily with the moment where you actually achieve it like our last one but those moments up to it uh what is causing you to go and actually learn this trick mm. cork is or is and it's going to take a lot of failures a lot of for a lot of pain and sores before you manage to get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, what would cause you to do this? And well, while there are lots of reasons why individual uh, individuals are willing to pursue tricks, undeniably putting a trick on a pedestal is going to make those people who view it as being on that pedestal, pedestal far more motivated 
to mm. seek it out in in certain circumstances. This we'll get into our cons list in which this won't happen. But assuming <laughs> that we've got a, an individual who's relatively ambitious, so they see something above them and think to themselves, "Fuck, I got to be there." Mm -hmm. So we got one of these people having a trick on a pedestal for them is an ultimate incentive to drive them towards it. It is motivation where, you know, they certainly, once again, individual trick of their own intrinsic motivation, but it can't hurt sometimes, especially when we're young to add some additional motivation to the activities that we're engaged in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting that like, having a trick as an object of desire makes it more desirable for other people like the, the whole reason why trip work is such a big deal to us is because it is collectively an object of desire amongst like a bunch of trickers and because there's this whole crowd crowd of like desire towards it it makes it more desirable to reach because it's just like oh wow like this is something that we all place subjective value into and that you should want to reach you know what I mean? And, I mean, that's just a, a normal human evolution type of thing. Like, if you're in a tribe and someone finds something desirable, it's like, you should also probably find it desirable because it's probably doing something good for them or it's probably, like, achieving some kind of ends or whatever. So, yeah. It, it's just, I feel like it's like a social credit type of thing. Although social credit has kind of a nasty connotation to it. Like, that's kind of what it I, is. I, I think, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely there's definitely like a market value to individual tricks and it's, yeah, it's def decided on the collective agreement of what everybody agrees is a trick. Mm -hmm. uh, and it works exactly the same way an economy would work because yeah, uh, it, it, we can't trade, can't just pay you for a trick, but it, it would, <laughs> it would take me a lot to buy a triple of you compared to something else because we all subjectively agree that that thing has a lot of value. I was going to so say, <laughs> I was gonna say, wait, we might have pay to win tricks soon. Okay, so <laughs> just never like rule that out. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, maybe one day in the future, but at the moment, you can't just pay someone and then immediately afterwards corkscrew. Of course, that that would uh, <laughs> that would kind of that, uh, like if something like that happened, where you, you know, I'm not. Sure, this is sort of a so excuse me. If, if you guys have ever heard of the concept of like downloading knowledge onto your brain, basically like they did video mm -hmm. in the Matrix. Yeah. That that would make a whole lot of things like education a whole lot more fun, but it would utterly trivialize a whole lot of uh, activities that we do for fun, like tricking. Imagine you showed up the first day of tricking and you literally know all of tricking. <laughs> yeah, you're what not wrong. Now? Yeah, because the, the whole reason why like these tricks on a pedestal are so cool is because of how exclusive they are. So yeah, if everyone all of a sudden could land it, it's like, okay, well, we don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> like, obviously... <laughs> So that's that's a good uh, point, and I also think it's funny that you bring up that, I guess, Neuralink type of downloading a program <laughs> thing, because it's like, now that I think about it, training is just programming your brain in just a really slow way, like you're just... Very slow way of doing it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in terms of this motivation thing, I think the last thing to be said is like, this works mostly for motivated people. And there, there are people that do tricking and they're not necessarily motivated to get the biggest trick and that's completely valid. And that's, that's a fine way of doing tricks, but they are less likely to want to pursue these tricks on a pedestal. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they might just be fucking around or, or they might be spreading laterally instead of forward, which is a great thing to do. So, and I think that's something we we're going to hit on in the cons. So, oh yeah. The concept of horizontal progression, the vertical progression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, and I mean, I guess to jump into the cons, uh, something that I kind of noticed as I was talking about this motivation point is that circular reasoning or feedback loop of a trick being on a pedestal. I think that as you make triple cork more and more desirable because more people like it, then it becomes more of a pedestal for for pretty much everyone in general. And so Triple Cork has this feedback loop, a, a positive feedback loop, where it becomes, like, greater and greater in our heads. And it at, it's kind of at the exclusion of other tricks, to be completely honest with you. Like, there are, like, a whole width of tricks to do. And when you're focusing solely on Triple Cork, it might limit some of that creativity to do other things, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I know you putting on horse blinders, putting, getting yourself the tunnel vision is never to improve your creativity. Right. That's not what, it, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the existence of this positive feedback loop, uh, you know, it, 
as much as it is good to have that motivation aspect, the more it's taking your attention away from things that you actually legitimately find more interesting. Mm-hmm. But because this thing has been in far, in, in uh, artificially inflated past its value, you can't see that thing anymore, mm-hmm. and that's unfortunate. Uh, uh, something that Jason was talking about earlier that I uh, thought was definitely important to bring into the cons here was actually the the idea that triple cork is a very good dipstick is um or rather a good measuring stick that's semi a con it definitely belongs in the category because uh, or at least partially because work can be a very good measuring stick to tell where someone's at mm-hmm. depending on their genre depending on their style mm-hmm. but for some you ask them to do triple cork and they will not give you a very satisfying attempt at a triple cork. Mm-hmm. That isn't at all a very good measure measuring stick for what they're capable of doing. Oh yeah. So by, and this sort of is getting to what you're saying of, you know, putting this one thing so far of everything else because it's constantly feeding itself back. It then gives people, um, you know, as, as once again, as nice as it is to have a really hard, or rather a really easy, fast way to decide whether someone's good or not. Mm-hmm. It turns out that the, the problem of deciding whether someone's a good trick or not is a little complicated than that. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. It's a very simplistic model to determine if someone's a good trick or just by one yeah. trick. And, well, and, and what all models are going to be, all models, what it means to be a model is I've made assumptions, so I've thrown out information to describe some very particularly small regime of things. Right. And so that's what, you know, the triple cork test can still be used to do that. It can still be used as a model to test the progress of twist bots. Mm-hmm. I would say, okay, getting into more nerdy shit, I would say it has a big positive predictive value, but probably a very low negative predictive value. And that you can correct me if I'm, if I'm using this incorrectly, but I would say that pretty much everyone, I would say 90% of the people that could triple cork are genuinely good trickers, but... If you can triple cork, that does not exclude you being a good tricker in the slightest. Like, if anything, that's a very bad predictor. Like, so if you get a negative result from this quote unquote test, that is not a good uh, a show of the value of the test. While if you get a yeah, positive it's, it's value, it's it's really good. Like, <laughs> did I use those correctly? I don't even know. Yeah, no, no. I I think that's the, I think that's a definitely an adequate way of describing it. We have mm-hmm. we have. Only that that test only is inconclusive in the case that you are using it on someone who's not a twist bot or someone who isn't capable of doing triple cork. Because yeah, you do it, and it may or may not be good. You you might be talking to a beginner, or you know, the, <laughs> it might just be that you found someone incredibly amazing on you know the side of the the, the I like I don't want to call it the OC genre of tricks because that just is a dumb name for it. But like the side of tricks. <laughs> where people are far more focused on putting uh, either basic or at least usual tricks together with uh, transitions that they don't normally get connected with. Like yeah. those sorts of people are incredibly talented in doing something very important for tricking. Most of them triple cork and that's totally okay. Well, I just want to say, Bryce, that OC is a genre trick and it's a genre trick that Manny Ramos has pioneered. And <laughs> really, when you, when you think about it, no one has ever done an OC because it's always just a remix of something Manny Ramos has done. Yeah, so, yes, exactly. He, he, I, I almost forgot that he gave us all the ability to do OC. Exactly. I should have. Uh, oh he's, my god! He's the only I, original copy. At the at, at the uh, at the little um, at the little gym session that Jason and I went to, uh, I was being an absolute. Uh, I, I was having a great time with this inside joke because every time anyone would do a nine, I would just shout that they need to put something in the Manny jar. <laughs> I'm going to get a jar that just Manny Ramos on it. And every time someone does a cheat nine, vanish nine, they have to put a quarter in it. Oh my God. That's we'll send the Manny Ramos mental health fund. Exactly. We'll send it to them. We'll it up. <laughs> oh my God. I think that's perfect. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, oh, so something else that me and Jason have talked about in the past, and this has to do with the positive feedback loop, is that you also have, it, because it's exclusionary inherently, you also have a negative feedback loop happening, or I guess it's technically a positive feedback loop, but in the negative direction uh, for tricks that aren't done as much. And like an example for us is like Croc and Muggle Slayer. Like you don't really see the Croc type of tricks as often, 
because no one does them and like no one really holds it in super high regard it's like oh you crocked like that was quirky cool like, like you know what i mean it's it's not like yeah oh, people fuck. will be impressed people will be impressed to see croc but they're not going to fawn over it like they would if they saw you do a triple cork which... exactly and so uh, as uh, like something i guess building up to uh the fact that other tricks are not done as much so that's just, such as muggle slayer you're also missing out on landing stances that lead into these tricks and that's also a positive feedback loop that like makes it less likely to happen basically if that makes any sense um, yeah the, cer certain stances certain even transitions in certain stances are just going to necessarily be left by the wayside because you're never going to be in the position to use them yeah i mean swing is so popular because everyone swings into everything but who the fuck is doing a reversal into tricks you know what i mean like swing is like the letter e in the english language i'm sure <laughs> wait I'm sure if we went yeah, oh, so no, this e is the letter that appears most frequent frequently in the english language oh yeah that's right uh, I would, I would suspect that if we were to go out and do a statistical analysis on uh, average trick and combos, we'd find that swing is overrepresented as a transition. There's a there's a distribution. Uh, you might know about this, but there's a... Um, basically, the most frequent word used is the. And then the next most frequent used word is like exactly half of the. And then the word mm -hmm. after that is exactly half. And you're halving it yeah. all the way down. We've yeah. talked about this before. It's called the Pareto distribution. Oh, it's that's not, also Pareto. Okay, shit. Yeah, it's not exactly. It, well, so the thing is, it's shaped change a little bit. It's not that it's necessarily always going to be going down by half, or it's not necessarily going to be the top 20% have 80 It can vary. You can top 30% have 70%. You, know, you, can change, you can change the shape of the curve. The idea, though, is that the rich get richer. As you accumulate more of this thing, you accumulate more of this thing. Mm, okay if you're on the lower if you're on the lower end you have uh you, you the amount that you have is lower uh basically uh what's the right word to use it's hmm. yeah i think the simplest way to say it is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer if you're okay. a tr if you're a transition that doesn't get used very often then the tendency that you don't get used very often mm. is continue into the future i i think you should do a math paper on how the frequency of tricks of certain <laughs> tricks and see like if they follow a Pareto distribution because um, that'd be fun it's but. probably true it's definitely a uh, thing statistical analysis i fucking hate statistics but it <laughs> is uh it's it's one of those parts of is like profoundly uninteresting to me but this mm. question is interesting to me so i might be able to force myself to do it damn i actually like stats um okay. but that's I'm fine so <laughs> that's stats is pretty cool too <laughs> yeah this is actually a stats only podcast uh, first of all if you're listening to this and you don't like stats get the fuck out if you're a dirty <laughs> fucking topologist i don't we don't want you here okay <laughs> but yeah um i think that's actually kind of do, do you guys have any more cons uh for this I guess I maybe one last thing I want to say is like the mental toll this takes on like someone who can't get to this level. Like let's say someone yes. really wants to get triple cork and they just can't fucking do it. Like that is honestly like that sucks. Uh, it it's, doesn't feel great to not get to the point where you want to get to. And especially if you're using this as a gauge of if you're a good trick or not. You know, if you've been tricking 12 plus years and you haven't landed triple cork, you might be like, what the fuck? I'm just a bad tricker. Which is Absolutely. not necessarily true in the slightest. So yeah, you know. like, this, is, this is another failure of the use of trick, sort of as a dipstick. Essentially, is you know, yeah, if you're the sort of person who really, really does care about it, and you're unfortunately not capable of landing it, you might sit there forever uh, disappointed in yourself for not being able to do this one thing, and not sitting there being grateful for all of the shit that you can do. You certainly would have had to learn a lot of fucking tricks by the time you're attempting triple cork, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but unfortunately, yeah, th this um, elevating something beyond reasonable levels puts you at a much higher uh, likelihood to not express gratitude for the things you already have. That's probably one of the biggest problems for trickers in all of tricking is not being grateful for the things you've already accomplished. Yeah. Tricking is a lot about progress, and progress is great. The, the desire to always push forward and go ahead is a good thing but not when it's causing you to not be grateful for the things you already have. Yeah. Not when it's causing you to take those things for granted. I think, yeah, I think me and Jason are very huge advocates for like, take a step back and be like, I could not double cork 
like two years ago and i thought it was unfathomable two years ago why the fuck am i complaining if i just like i can only dub hyper and i can't triple cork like you know what i mean is like yeah Yeah, so definitely be proud of how far you've gone because you put a lot of work in i mean i I think that's why triggers respect so many other triggers is because we remember what it's like to be the newbie and to like not know anything and like a lot of triggers that got into tricking it did not happen in the formative years of our life it happened when we were like 15 16 so we have very yeah. vivid memories of starting out and being shitty at it so i think that definitely plays a part in that and like i don't get you wrong as we move forward some of us do forget i've definitely forgotten sometimes how much i've struggled for tricks um uh, mm-hmm. but yeah you just gotta remember that shit so i don't know <laughs> remember remember that shit and yeah don't don't take anything for granted. For never, granted. never let any, exactly never let anything be a rock. But yeah, don't take anything <laughs> for granted. And and for the very simple reason that you know, um, tricking is a series of gifts that you're going to get from your body. You're going to be given these wonderful things, and you're going to work for them. They're not gifts that you don't earn. Mm-hmm. But um, like any gift, imagine there was something you wanted desperately. You put it on your Christmas list list every single year, um, mm-hmm. and every time you got a present that wasn't it you just tossed it away and threw and spend any time appreciating any of it. Mm -hmm. When you finally did get the gift that you want, how do you think you're going to treat it? Mm -hmm. Do you think you're going to treat it like something that's special and important Mm -hmm. after you spent years practicing doing the opposite? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. You've conditioned it. It's not to happen. Fuck off. Exactly. (laughs) Past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you have spent your entire tricking career, not being grateful, for the tricks you've landed so far, Mm -hmm. then whatever tricks you have on the horizon that you want to land, Mm -hmm. you will also not feel great after having landed those. You might have that moment that we described earlier, the really hype, oh, this is so good, everybody ran up and hugged me, and and that moment will feel good. You'll definitely get the influence during that. But afterwards, when you're supposed to still be in the afterglow of your accomplishment, it won't be, because you never practiced being there, and that's something that you have to practice. Gratitude is a skill that you need it, it's actually so i actually recently started journaling because i'm like i need to actually make a checklist of shit i need to do and a part of it that i've included is like writing stuff i'm grateful for and it's there you go. so frustrating how how good it is for your mental health it's just like it just sounds like one of those bullshit things where it's just like oh, i'll just write something you're grateful for and it's like really what the fuck but it's actually like like i said frustrating how well it works it's like <laughs> okay this is weird um i completely agree it is a skill that you develop um and definitely be grateful for the shit you have um and yeah i i don't know like i i'm a b- really big advocate of celebrating when you land a trick like you should scream to the heavens you should like really be excited uh because to me like that i don't know to me that's like weirdly a humbling experience it's not being you being full yourself if anything when you don't celebrate that's like i don't know (laughs) yeah to to me it's just like oh i knew i was gonna do that like you know (laughs) that's like the opposite of humble i actually think celebrating is way more humble than than not celebrating so i'm definitely a huge advocate of like yeah cheers like fucking celebrate when you whenever you land a trick even if it's not triple cork like it's fine like double cork it was your first double cork fucking celebrate dude like Mm -hmm. you know so yeah but also one last note i guess i want to hit on for the pedestal tricks unless you guys want to say something else is that sometimes we'll see it sacrilegious to compare some tricks to like a pedestal trick so if you if you say something is harder than or i guess when we were growing up i should say uh if you said something was harder than triple cork like let's say like double croc or something like that some people would be like what the fuck is wrong with you like triple cork is like the peak like there's no there's no greater thing it's just triple cork (laughs) so like what the fuck are you saying (laughs) So I just thought that was interesting because I definitely had that backlash before with the certain tricks I've said, um, especially like vert kicks. Like I'll be like, yeah, hyper triple 12. Like that's harder than triple cork. And people are like, excuse me. <laughs> so I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. But if you guys want to move on, uh, I also want to talk about triggers on a pedestal because this is also something that we very much do and can be good and can be really bad. So yes, yeah. both for ourselves <clears throat> and the trickers on the pedestals. Mm, yes, I completely agree with you. I think we've seen a few uh, falls from Greece that haven't been that <laughs> less than graceful. But <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
it's it's interesting because tricking is such a novel sport that there was a time period where I guess it still exists to an extent, but there's people that are just miles ahead of everyone else. And like, obviously the biggest one that comes to our heads is Guthrie because Guthrie held that throne for a lot of years. Like he was really really long time. Yeah. He was undeniably the best and it wasn't even by a little bit. It was like, Oh, he's literally leagues ahead of the second person. And I mean, seeing that every day is obviously going to affect how you view this person or how you view tricks or how you view life in general, to be honest with you, because like, I mean that that's just, I want to say not normal to see, but I know it exists in other sports and in other activities, I guess. Um, so I don't know. I mean, what, what do you guys think of that? Like just trickers? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's hard to find that in a sport like American football, for example, where there are so many people who have been trying for so many years to be their very, very best that when you go and take the people at the peak, and I'm, I don't know shit about football, so I guess I, I'm talking a teeny bit out of my ass here, but I, from what I understand, the people at the very height of American football, they're not leagues ahead of each other. They're all hovering around about the same area, which is practically about the physical maximum that human beings can achieve in that sport because they've been working on it for fucking years now. Yeah. And that's what the, the only way we're getting, get people more athletic in football is when they start augmenting them with like knee replacements and shoulder replacements that let them punch through walls and shit. Yeah. I was going to say they, they actually, their training regimen is fucking insane. And, and I'm not even only speaking for college football, actually, I don't even know about professional cause I did work for a college football team and I mean, these guys would work out like I shit you not 10 hours a day and they would also eat so fucking much like their their coaches would literally just like feed them Oreos just like you need more calories. Just get them in. <laughs> like it's <laughs> like the absolute limit of like how much a person can eat and also move around like yeah. it's. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It is fucking insane. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I, you know, I have never coached professional football, but in my opinion, as uh, an athlete and someone who has uh, done lots of exercise, working out for 10 hours a day is never a good idea because at this, a certain amount, after a certain amount of work, mm-hmm. uh, no amount of food or sleep is going to allow you to recover fast enough. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I guess it depends on what exercises they were doing. If they were doing nothing but like straight weight training for 10 hours, first of all, how <laughs> second of all uh well, yeah their muscles would never be able to repair themselves in time now if like the the training was like some of this is sprints and some of these are like other you know body weight or plyometric drills then i could probably see that working but still 10 hours of work is uh, a daily yeah. uh, you just you're not going to recover from that also when the fuck do you eat <laughs> when, when do you do? <laughs> i guess hey. I, I should clarify so the, the 10 hours would usually happen during camp which is during the summer so they would have like a two or three week block where they would work out that much and that 10 hours does also include a lot of mental drills so it's it's also they're they're okay. running plays but they're not quite you know they don't put their full force into it they're just walking yeah. to where they would be walking and or where they would be running in the actual play so like okay. yeah it's not just like oh they're way training the <laughs> Good. but still like regardless like that's like that's like that reminded me of like early days i don't know how much you guys ever got into the online fitness community but there's lots of uh, YouTube fitness experts and back a couple of years ago one of the things that was just most common to recommend was like there'd be a whole bunch of guys who very clearly uh use steroids because you just look at them and you're like all right how the fuck do you get like that and then their advice for people was just like yeah i work out for like five hours a day and i do all of you guys. like no that's not how that works that's not sustainable and, <laughs> and not- you also like it, you build better muscle if you do rest in, in the proper time <sighs> something like that so it's, it, it's crazy but you, people don't recognize realize it but as far as bodybuilding is concerned mm-hmm. um most of it has to do with how good your sleep and diet is mm, i agree as someone who has tried to gain weight and gain muscle, I can guarantee you that that's probably one of the more essential parts. I remember really stressing out about not being able to get eight hours of sleep and it would prevent me from going to sleep because I was stressing oh, no. about how like I would not build my muscle because I wasn't going to sleep properly. <laughs> so, so yeah, as, regardless, I guess the point is like these people at the top in football put so many hours into their sport and they're doing it at equal levels so it's like the variation between them is not as big that being said there are some outliers i know like tom brady was like a big deal in football i also don't follow football too too heavily but i know he was Mm -hmm. like oh shit like he's a killer quarterback 
But that might also have to do with more of his mental skill too, because I know being a quarterback has a lot to do with strategizing. Yeah, um, and I'm, he's an old fellow. He's got lots of experience. He's one of the few really veteran players. So I think that probably does come into play as well. But the, the most important reason for bringing up um, this whole aside to do with football players is to point out how much this is not the situation with tricking. Mm -hmm. In football, we've got people who... I, I would hesitate to say that we have figured out what the human capacity for football is because people are always getting better. But we're very much closer to that in football than we are in tricking. We're still not really sure what exactly we can say for a fact humans can and can't do. Right. Like people are, you know, for a long time, people are like, quad quirk's not really, like it's one of those things that you just like physically don't have the ability to do it. And then people did it. So it's clearly not the case. Right. Some people still sort of feel that way about quintuple full. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, wins, uh, you know, but we've seen people already throw and uh, get them onto mats and stuff. I don't know uh, how much you guys know about Kenzo Shirai. Uh, Who's that? A, a Japanese tumbler. Is years ago, he's retired now. He doesn't do, uh, he doesn't tumble anymore. But he was the last person that I knew of outside working who is working towards quintuple full. Yeah, he's done 4.5, right? Because I feel like I've seen he's him. He's done 4.5 4. punch brandy. I, I think that a tricker is going to land the first quint, which I think is going to be very magical. I'm going to be like, because yes. <laughs> that's insane. Like, it, it's just like, it's a gymnastics move. Inherently, like, gymnasts literally created this move. But a tricker is the first one. And It'd be even more insane if it was like Shosei crawling into it from a fucking scoot. It'd be like, like gymnasts would be like, "What the fuck, dude? What like fuck? this dude just crawled into like one of the." And when they things. ask about it, we'll just say no. But that's basically like our round off. <laughs> yeah, and just to piss them off, so. it's so good. Yeah, it, is. <laughs> it is. It doesn't make sense. For, I don't know. Scoot doesn't make sense to me. Um, I think if a trigger were to do quint cork, or I mean quint full, I'm sorry, it would be very similar to the triple cork moment where it was a trick that was, you know, maybe double cork had been done in Capoeira and, you know, a trick. Mm -hmm. It was something that it also similar to a triple B twist. It was something that came from another practice mm -hmm. and that tricking has just excelled past mm -hmm. the limits of like that initial practice. Right. Like you, like Bryson mentioned earlier, with double B twist, like, you know, you could see Wushu masters doing double B twist, but triple B twist, absolutely unheard of until john vanek showed us how to do it yeah and i mean and we're talking like wushu masters people who invented the trick you know it's insane <laughs> and gets insane height too i don't know if yeah. you've seen these videos but they get so much height but basically what i'm understanding from this is that trickers are just really good at stealing shit so <laughs> yeah but i think actually something that uh plays a part into what bryce was saying about uh you know, football being mostly optimized. Oh, Bryce just brought his dog. I'm sorry. That was really cute. Um, no, see, yeah, she was barking. I had to go grab her. <laughs> oh, oh, facts. Um, anyway, uh, something that actually plays a part into what you were saying about uh, the football thing and it's being, it's like most of them are roughly at the same level. I think something that speaks to that is that it to, to become a pro football player, you don't just have to like, work really hard and be super motivated and work out all the time it's also like kind of winning the genetic lottery too yes, like you, you, you the lottery. yeah meanwhile in tricks it's like you've we've seen a lot of different body types and a lot of different people land triple quirk so it's mm -hmm. like we know we have not even come close to the limit there in tricking in my opinion um meanwhile in football it's mostly optimized so yeah, you kind of have yeah. to also have good genes with it. So, and even even in those areas where in tricking we perhaps are coming to the limits, like something with like quintuple full, that's just one area. Tricking expands in so many different directions. And it's like, all right, well, uh, what is the maximum that we're reaching with vert kicks that you vanish into? Mm -hmm. uh, people have done fourteens now, so you can't. Sixteens. Excuse me. Yeah, you can't tell me that. Uh, you can't tell me that twelves were the end. Like, there's so much shit that still get and that was just vanish there's still swing kicks people don't really touch swing kicks very often no and i think there's so you could do triple cork round vertical like seriously and no one's <laughs> ever done that i think that's is that swing 16 technically yeah i yeah. think so yeah oh my god that's fucking insane someone should do that like now <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean i guess in terms of the chosen one narratives um i i think we perpetuate this myth of like oh my god this this tricker is the chosen one or they're like the greatest ever by like the weight, the terms of endearment we use 
And what I mean by that is, like, we'll look at something and we'll be like, oh, that's that's alien. Oh, like, he's the GOAT. He's the greatest of all time. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, we're, like, ascribing a, tor- a somewhat, like, otherness towards this person mm-hmm. in yes. veneration well, and, of them. Especially when we use titles like God or anything like that, or even Chosen One, really, because Chosen mm-hmm. One historically literally means the one chosen by God. Right. So it, it, it is to say that at least subconsciously we are ascribing to these people some sort of ascendance that they are beyond the state that we're at mm-hmm. at least very at the very least in the language that we use to describe them with mm-hmm. and i think that's at the core of what i'm trying to get at is that there's this otherness of they're a god and we're just mere mortals like that's it like and, and like to i even right now i just want to say like yeah that's absolutely true like i am a mere mortal <laughs> when i look at shosei but i need to like stop myself because no like shosei is a, a human fucking being just like me so is guthrie all right we we've just ascribed this like these motions in 3d space to be good or not good yeah and, and so a couple of us have decided that these individuals have gone through their apotheosis but that never actually happened they're all still just people Literally, yeah. So it becomes, a, it becomes especially clear if you ever like talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're all just fucking anime nerds. So it's just like, um, but yeah, no, I completely agree with you. It, it's interesting that we ascribed, it, and like I said before, I even then I want to say like, yeah, that they're absolutely otherworldly. Um, but yeah, they're just human fucking beings, and just interact with them like they're human fucking beings. That's it. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> it's yeah it's it's not necessarily good for any of us to be sitting here and going all right that person is so far above and beyond me i need to venerate them to the point where i literally can't talk to them like a normal person that's <laughs> that's not helpful in fact yeah. lots of people who have been in that position have in the past complained about the fact that people don't talk to them like a normal person mm-hmm. like that's the i mean think about it you having uh this is something that i was reminded of from ender's game if you ever uh, read it there was a point in the book where he was talking about how everybody respected him so much and he had literally too much damn respect because he just couldn't <laughs> get anybody to talk to him like a normal person anymore right and that's sort of the the situation that i feel like some of these people wind up in where, you know, they've, they get that really awesome positive feedback loop. This is triumphant. You have this achievement. You are capable of doing these things that you highly value, Mm -hmm. but they lose being a normal person, which is (laughs) not something to shake a stick at. Right. That's like a big, big thing. (laughs) God, this just makes me think of like all those angsty teenager, like superhero superpower movies where they'd be like, I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for this power. (laughs) And it's just like, bro, shut the fuck up. Like, (laughs) like, like I would kill to be Spider-Man. But at the same time, it does bring up a good point. Like there, there is a reason why that was a narrative in that story. And like, it is genuinely a thing that people feel. It's just like, it doesn't seem like real to us because we're just normal. Yeah. So we're just like, fuck off. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. It's, it's very hard for us. It's very hard for people who have never been in that situation to empathize with that desire for being normal for, or at least for normal human contact, mm-hmm. because yeah, that's literally all we ever get. So uh, sitting there and desiring that would be like desiring oxygen. Okay. Breathe. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, it's just like I just want to be a normal high school kid. I just want everything <laughs> like it's literally. Fucking go look in the mirror, chump. It's like that was the tagline to all of those fucking movies. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> but um, yeah. So I I don't know. It, I just want to say that I think reality is definitely messier than like we make it out to be in terms of like oh like if you do this you're just amazing or something like that. Like like I said, these are just uh. I guess arbitrary movements that we've ascribed like meaning to and it's not necessarily like a, a hardcore measure of if someone's like a god or not you know what I mean it's kind of what I'm trying to get at um and I don't know I, I think that's some way that it could be I guess a con of like having chosen ones or having like a, a tricker on a pedestal is that they just they get venerated so hard that they just cease to be a regular person in our heads, which I don't think is a good thing. So, and, and, you know, and this is, it's not universal because like there are definitely people, 
I, I sort of had this thing where some of the really, really great, uh, great big people, I had the benefit of meeting them before I knew who they were. So mm-hmm. I treated them like normal people. And then by the time I found out who they were, mm-hmm. I didn't suddenly start treating them like gods because the first time I talked to them, I just treated them like a normal person. Right. But like, yeah, it's, it, so it's, it's, you know, it's certainly not universal. I, I know lots of people who have that same story with a whole lot of really, really good trickers. Mm-hmm. But for those other people, you know, the way they got into tricking was specific by watching videos of these people. Mm-hmm. Think about how much those folks are losing out on by having a mindset that prevents them from talking to these folks like a normal person. Right. There's so much they could gain from that conversation, but they can't have it. Oh, yeah. Even like me who like, I want to say that I've been pretty hyper aware of the fact that like you should approach a big name tricker just like a normal human being. Even me being really hyper aware of that's how I should interact with them. There has been times where I just don't want to talk to a trick because I'm like, why would Vivian Yulu talk to me? Like, why, why, in what universe does that even make sense? Like, it, it, like, obviously that's such a dumb statement, but mm-hmm. I think it really dawned on me that it's just like, okay, this is a dumb way of thinking when Vivian Yulu, like, complimented one of my tricks. Like, he did that one of the trick tricks, and I'm like, what the fuck just happened? And I'm like, I'm, we're, we're just trickers. We're just throwing tricks and complimenting each other. Like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> like, so I think that's a healthy way to, to get into it. And that being said, I will say that sometimes it does get to these people who have been venerated heads. Like, they sometimes if they get called a god enough they will start to believe that and i i definitely have seen uh trickers that act a certain way because they know they have so much social capital so it goes both ways it's definitely like (laughs) like it could be to the detriment of the person interacting with the chosen one tricker or the chosen one trickers detriment you know what i mean so yeah yeah but um, hang on a second. What do you say, babe? With great power comes great responsibility. Oh, true. <laughs> Did you hear that? Uncle Ben. It's Uncle Ben. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, I actually watched Spider-Man 1 last night. Oh. The, the Sam Raimi ones. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so How's good, right? doing? How's he looking? Oh, as good as he did back in 1990, whatever. <laughs> or whenever that came out. Dude, it was like 2000, what, like five or some shit? Yeah, know. probably. Yeah. Bringing me back. I fucking love those movies, actually. I love Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. Yeah, um, despite how, how cheesy and really bad some of the dialogue in those movies were, absolutely still kind of see them as 10 out of 10. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't realize how bad they were until I watched it last night. And I, I it appreciate is, that about them now. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. It, it's really cringy, actually. I feel like it I is, gotta watch it It, it is not quite Tommy Wiseau levels of, like, The Room. But yeah, going back and watching that is, like, it, you can... You get to cringe your spine out of your back a couple of times. Well, there's, like, a literal, like, the scene where Spider-Man saves, like, Mary Jane, she, like, says something to him about his eyes, and he just looks at her and doesn't say anything. And then she's like, okay, bye now. And then, like, gets out of his grasp and walks away. Like, I was oh like... Oh, my God. <laughs> but, hey, little kid me related to that so hard, okay? I was like, this is exactly what's going to happen in my life. This is exactly how everything is going to go. <laughs> Oh my god. I also love the dance scene in Spider-Man 3. That was great. Oh my god. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. I love emo Toby though. <laughs> yeah. I, I also like that that they still keep referencing that dancing. Like they're very hyper aware of how shitty that scene was. And like into the Spider-Verse they reference it. I don't know if you guys seen it, but is yeah. I definitely recommend Into the Spider-Verse to you and all of our fan base. Anyway, we should probably get back to chosen one narratives. <laughs> yes, yeah, probably. <laughs> and well, like, so we, we talked about we, we gave we gave our you know we discussed tricks, we discussed discussed trickers, and a little bit of the pros and cons. Is there anything, uh, any any way that we can wrap up the sort of stuff that we're talking about? Any way we can put a bow on all this? You think? Yeah, uh, I guess something I really want to say is when I think of tricking culture. I don't know, Chosen One narrative sometimes, like, really is antithetical to tricking culture sometimes to me, because to me, it's, like, about just being in a space with a bunch of your homies and just doing some tricks, and people are like, oh, that looks dope. Oh, like, Mm -hmm. you know, you should do this. So, like, like, just fucking around and, like, complimenting each other and stuff like that, and, like, no one is, like, necessarily better than anyone else. And even though, like... You know, in the back of my, our minds, like, we do know, like, okay, yeah, he could triple court, like, he's pretty, he's really good. But, like you said, there's this horizontal expansion that other people can go into. So, we have different specializations. And 
so chosen one narratives and like you know putting a trick on a pedestal seems like very antithetical to that to me because it's like we're watching one person because we want to see them do the best tricks and that's it like you know what i mean is like it's, yeah it's, it, it sort of stands apart from another aspect of tricking culture that i think we all are really really appreciative of and it's the idea that um when you're at a gathering what people are cheering for is not uh it, not where you're at and not necessarily your level mm -hmm. but your effort Mm -hmm. which is why someone who's at the very beginning of their tricking career can walk out in the middle of a circle and get everybody to cheer for them. If they do, if they do something that they're, that is difficult for them, that took a lot of effort on their behalf. Everybody cares. Everybody's hyped. Everybody is excited. And yeah, that, that aspect of our culture where we're rewarding, not necessarily where you're at, but the idea that you're pushing forward, mm -hmm. that stands in opposition to this idea of, all right, well, now because of where you're at we're going to ascribe special significance to you mm -hmm. you know yeah no it, it, i i completely agree with that because actually that's something that really drew me into tricking like in the first session i went to is like i remember seeing like one of the better trickers in the gym kyle like he would do a triple full and like i thought that was fucking insane and everyone would cheer obviously and then i saw someone else and they would just do like i didn't know what it was at the time it was just like a basic flip and i could tell it was a basic flip because it was like nothing compared to the triple fold that just happened yeah. and everyone still cheered and i'm like whoa okay that's pretty cool so i could just start doing stuff and people will cheer me on like i am really into this so that really drew me into tricking to begin with so i i don't know i i definitely agree with that but um I, it's it was one of my favorite things about tricking early on but it stand it is exactly orthogonal it is perfectly perpendicular mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. idea of uh, ascribing chosen one narratives to certain tricks. Yeah, no, I agree. It's it doesn't really it's not really related to it in in any kind of way. But I think something else that we get into whenever we talk about chosen ones is that sometimes we neglect Actually, I think triggers are pretty good about it, um I guess looking at the trick in history and and kind of veterating the people that came before us to an extent. Um mm -hmm. But I think they miss on the greater community. And what I mean by that is we look at a tricker and we say like, oh, they're the chosen one. They created this and this and this and they did this. But you also have to remember that like uh, everything's like built on the shoulders of giants. OK, and those giants that I talk about, and those giants are actually made of a bunch of much smaller people standing on each other's shoulders. Exactly. I was going <laughs> to say it's not that there is Scott Skelton and he's the giant that like Guthrie stood on top of, even though that is true to an extent, I think. Uh, an even truer statement would be to say that pretty much every tricker that has come before Guthrie has helped Guthrie become the tricker he is at the moment. And that is something that I feel like trickers need to acknowledge a lot more. So, yeah, that's like my two cents. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> even stuff like, I don't know, like I remember he was popularizing Shirk and Cutter. Like Javier Macias was one of the first people who did Shirk and Cutter, or Shirk and Box, I should, or, sorry, Shirk and Hyperhook because it was B Twist. Um, and I also remember that Pullen did, uh, Crash Moon and Crash Moon was how Guthrie kind of started doing his shirking cutters. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, it's all interconnected and, you know, even the most basic tricker has brought something to the community to influence another tricker to do another thing and then so on and so on, like in a domino effect, you know? So, yeah, I don't know. Do you guys have any more to say about chosen one narratives or trickers on a pedestal? I think that kind of covers it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I've wrung my brain out. I think I've squeezed every last little drop of juice out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought it was a really good conversation. I, I mean, I liked uh, discussing these topics and uh, I don't know. I we, we always write these show notes and I'm always like looking at them. I'm like, oh, fuck, like I... I don't, I don't know. Whenever I read them over again, I'm like, wow, we actually had a really insightful idea. And I, it like helps me in my tricking journey in terms of like, oh, I need to be grateful about tricks again. Or I need to remember that every other tricker has helped Guthrie become the tricker he is now. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. I like it. So anyway, I mean, what's up? Yeah, I think that's all. I think that's about all we have to say. And I'm interested to hear when we do post this, what other people think about uh, this aspect of our culture, because, you know, mm -hmm. We're, we're three schmucks talking about our idea of it, but really uh, what this means to tricking and trickers is something that's ultimately going to be decided by a conversation that happens between all of us. And so hopefully uh, 
enough people are interested in this after listening to start that conversation. Yeah. So let us know in the comments what you think about this. And as always, thank you to Stephen French for doing our art, Alexander for being the logo, and Stephen Rogers for our intro song. I'll catch you guys later. Bye.